Hello everyone, welcome back to the Lyceum Podcast, where the fruits of contemplation are shared with others. That's my little new slogan, I hope you like it. I got it from Emmanuel Kant, and I think it's a beautiful way of uh, describing what learning and teaching is. I'm not teaching you anything, I'm just sharing a contemplation with you, and I like to contemplate. It's a good way to hold the world in your hands and see what you feel most, and whatever you feel most tends to be what's most profound. But anyway, I'm your host as usual, Riyad Haseeb. I want to take this quick moment to thank those who have taken their time out of the day to listen. But before we jump into the fruit bowl, can we attempt to get at least 15 likes on this video? That would be most welcome. I mean, 15 likes doesn't sound much, but Jesus only had 12 disciples. So 12, 15, 10, it's all better than none. And uh, everyone that comments shows love and all the beautiful Instagram messages I get from you guys uh, it really touches my heart because this is what I set out to do, uh, like I just said a second ago, to share contemplation with others. And when I see others really taking an active role in that and joining me in that is a great feeling. Also, I do have a group chat, the Lyceum Reading Group. So drop a comment or DM me on Instagram, give me your number, I'll add you. We share philosophical pages, books from literature, we discuss quotes. And uh, it's a good way to season your mind. You can only sharpen a knife against other metals. So I like to assume this group chat is full of other metals. And uh, we're all sharpening and refining each other's intellects and minds. And, you know, we're not geniuses, but we're trying to move towards that direction. But as you can read by the title, to live the unexamined life is not worth living at all. A beautiful yet profound statement by one of history's greatest products. And that man is Socrates. A name that you've heard, I'm sure, before. And it's not the Brazilian midfielder from the 1970s, yeah? I grew up thinking Socrates was a midfielder who played for Brazil. But it turned out he, the real Socrates, or not the real one, but the, uh, the, the wise man who walked around Athens. Like I say, this is not going to be a deep dive on the man himself. This is an analysis video on the quote and why I feel so passionately about it. And I'm going to try and wipe your perceptions with the cloth of wisdom so you too can see what I see. If you wish to learn more on Socrates, read the books itself. I mean, you can easily watch YouTube and documentaries and summaries, but the, these books don't exist to be summarized, okay? They're not products of knowledge, they're products of wisdom. And how do you gain wisdom? You've got access to book yourself. It, essentially, that way you eliminate the middleman and his perspective, which often gets mixed in with his own. That's why the education system, when they teach Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, it's always going to be half-hearted because the teacher and the education system are the middleman. Plato's here, education system, you. You're getting a filtered version. You can argue the middleman is a filter. Um, but remove the middleman, get direct contact with Plato, you can get a lot more wisdom out of it. In fact, you're actually drinking from the source now, not bottled water. And I actually dare somebody to read the works containing anything of Socrates, the Symposium, the Republic, um, the Phaedo, and try and not be seduced, infected, or even moved by his wisdom. The thing about great works is that they stand the test of time. Essentially, they're words made from marble. Many of, the, many of the books we have nowadays, I would argue, are wood. They'll wither and rot away in the next 50 to 100 years. But the Shakespeare's, the Plato's, the Goethe's, the Nietzsche's, they're, they're words made out of marble. They're beautiful and they stand tall and they shall stand the test of time for sure. But I was 21 when I first read that great sage. His words often left my mind with no words, but just tears itself. Not because of sadness, but tears can also be a replication of beauty, an expression of beauty. A great sign that you have encountered wisdom is when what you hear surpasses the intellect, which often likes to break down, think, weigh up and analyse. But wisdom goes straight through to the soul. The intellect tries to catch up, and but cannot. For wisdom speaks directly to the intuition. You know that what you have just heard is truth. You cannot dispute it. Thus, the tear is the confirmation that truth is heard. And this is exactly what this quote, to live the unexamined life, it's not worth living at all, done for me. When I read it, 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 it struck me immediately. Like I say, I, I replied with a tear, not with a, I agree, you know, it was a tear. And that is sometimes way more potent than a, I agree. Yeah, so when I came across it, I knew it to be completely true. The arrows of critical thinking were simply warded off. Now, Socrates was a man who always pushed for the discussion of what the good life is. What makes a good life? A conversation I wish more young people had nowadays. 
Not a successful life, a good life. Now the idea of goodness is a question I have to probably postpone for another day, but it's certainly a question that ponders on my life. Like, What is a good life? The question perhaps is one of the first two principles in all philosophy. I argue philosophy could be reduced down to two questions. What makes a good life? And how does one approach death best? These two questions are the most fundamental questions in all of philosophy, in my opinion. Is the acceptance of mortality and how do you make the most of your time in this life best served? I mean, how can all literature falls under these two questions? All doctrines and religious doctrines fall and crumble away at these two questions. Because it's the two questions I argue human beings ask the most. How can I live a good life? And how do I want to approach death? For many young people nowadays, we avoid this question. It's not that deep, bro. To live the unexamined life is not worth living at all. In my heart of hearts encapsulates the essence of life itself. What this man said in a sentence, it takes others to write in a book. And that's always a great sign of someone profound. It takes what they, they say something in little and it takes others to say in many, many words. And what this quote really calls out for is, how could you be given the gift of life and not examine what you've been dealt? Life is not easy, but trust me, me and you both know this life isn't easy. It's tough and full of pain. Thus, if you cannot examine and try to look into the bottom of the river, you shall find no fish. You shall starve. And many of us in this generation are starving, crying and scared for the force of life is powerful. And we often get swept away by it. Me, many times in my own life, I've been swept away by the force of life. Without examining or stopping to reflect upon the stars, I forgot there was even stars, and that's my life. 18, 19, I was going through the rat race. And I mean, I'm still in the rat race, but I'm not chasing the same cheese as everyone wants. I'm chasing wisdom now. And that's an ambition that's taken me a long way, a long time to kind of find, but that's what I think a good life is, a life of wisdom. Yet, Without any reflection, examination or an, or an attempt to know yourself, you shall forever walk around with the shades on and be blind to the beauty and joy that surrounds you. And what does it really mean to say life is a gift? I mean, this is a word we throw around all the time. Life is a gift. Cherish it. More life. Happy birthday. Appreciate life. But what, is the, what does that line mean? Life is a gift, eh? Such a throwaway line, I'd argue. It means you have one shot at being you. Thousands of years of human history weigh upon your shoulders, yet you and me are the first of our species. No one in history has ever been you. No one has been real to see before. I'm unique to nature. Thus, more than anything, you must examine your own talents and joys and capabilities. For who knows, they may have been of service to man itself. And I truly believe all human ambition should be to benefit your species in some way, I say. That's my ambition since a kid. Money's great, but I only want money to help. I only want power to empower. That's true power, I argue. That's what leadership is, in my opinion. Someone who takes power to empower, not power to self-serve. That's why pride is a sin. But pride can protect. But this is why you need to examine, because pride could be good at sometimes, and pride could be negative sometimes. If you don't examine, you assume pride is something that is... A weapon that works all the time, but it still cuts yourself at sometimes. But anyway, one of my favorite people is Anne Frank. That beautiful little mind once said, I'll make my voice heard. I'll go into the world and work for mankind itself. And if you do not come away from reels, trends, gossip, drugs, and all the pleasures we often assume are not evils, then how will you ever find how you can best serve humanity without those silent moments with thyself it seems life becomes pointless for you shall forever be a puppet a hole in your soul where corporations politicians and social media gurus can put their hand in and manipulate you how many people do you meet when they speak you know exactly where you heard it from ah you said this and this and that i know exactly where they got it from Examine your life and be honest. Many of us are just wearing eyes with stains upon them. As Plato once said, learning cleans perceptions. Go out and examine your life. And how do you do that? Well, we'll get to that. 
but learning cleans perceptions. And what does that really mean? When you learn, you replace what you already knew. That's why in philosophy they say you have to die every day. Every time you learn something, it's a new death. Because you kill the old you to replace the new you. With enlightenment, with something new to offer to the table. What subjects or interests spark the passions? What do you like to do that melts time itself? You know that beautiful painting by Salvador Dali? That it's the persistence of time and the clocks are melting. I used to perceive it in the way that that's the, that's the domain I, res, I exist in when I do my passions. When I do my writing and reading, time melts. It's a melting clock. Too many of us in this life are like children in a candy store. We go to whatever sparks our interests. Ooh, Skittles. Ooh, crypto. Ooh, clothing labels. Ooh, Forex. Ooh, sneaker reselling. Ooh, this and ooh, that. And at the end of each taste, we always return to square one. Why? Because we're not running in a straight line. We're actually running and going here. To the left and to the right and to the left to the right. And when we come back out of those hallways, we realize we're in the same place the whole time. For we have not reflected and examined our talents, our passions, and perhaps thought of how we could benefit the next man. We always want to self-serve ourselves through money, fame, power. Only through examin examination will you find your strengths and find your weaknesses. You must avoid that which expresses all your limitations and focus on what you can be great in. I'll say that again. You cannot, folk, you cannot go into something that expresses your weaknesses and limitations. Life is very short. Yes, you must make mistakes. But through learning and reflection, you minimize the pain. You minimize the impact. Because like they say, insanity is when you do the same thing over and over again expecting different results. Thus, yes. It might be a lesson, but have you learned it? That's what you have to ask yourself. And in learning and reflecting and examining, you avoid pain and more wasted time. You are here for a limited amount of time. Examination of your life is the greatest way to show your love for life. So how does the young child show their true interest and love for something? By holding it close to the body or face. And you must do the same with your own life, I'd argue. Or another image for you is live life with a magnifying glass around your neck. Every moment that comes that deserves your attention, you must look and hone in and zone in. But not just to reflect and look. It's no point sitting there and saying, this is what's happened to me. Oh my God, I'm reflecting, I'm thinking, I'm reliving. No, you have to use knowledge. Only knowledge can liberate you from suffering. And you have to ask yourself, why do we remember things that we don't wish to remember? A lot of memories are involuntary, you know? Um, you, you're in a moment, you're like, why do I remember that specific moment? Maybe it's a time for you to examine that. Maybe your mind is saving that for later. Watch for later. And through examination, you relive a perspective twice. Because remember, we only live a moment once. Upon examination and reflection, we live it twice. That's why students, when they do an essay, they have to reflect and reread the essay after to see where they made a mistake. So next time they can do what's accordingly. Do you do the same for your own life? And if you don't, suffer the consequences. Because you're free of choice, but you're not free of consequences. Through examination, you know yourself. What you love and what you dislike. What expresses joy and which does not. Just as we know our taste buds when it comes to food, we must be the same in the actions of life. It really is pointless to live a life without knowing yourself. It's just as if you went to an art gallery and walked through it without ever looking upon or contemplating what you've just seen. Or even worse, without examination, you are living a life on a time lapse. You know those little videos, how can you live a life like that? You're not cherishing the gift that you was given. Life is a gift. And just for you to go, Oh, uh, okay, thanks. Put it on the side. Is disgraceful. How many young people die at 18, 19, 25, 35, 95, uh, not 95, 45? We say, wow, tragic. They die so young. And yet you still have the gift of life inside of you. You don't examine what's in front of you. Tragic is what I say. That's the real tragedy. The benefits of self examination are endless. By knowing yourself, you know others. You know your pain in them or ignorance. You recognize they are just as human as you. Thus, you treat them with more kindness. In knowing yourself, you become a better friend, a lover, a partner, a human. As the saying goes, every man is his own prison. Yet I argue 
through a life of examination is where the keys to opening the cell of every man lies freeing him because we are in community you know me i know you i know myself therefore i know you how you act is how i act how i act is how you act that's what we call a brotherhood a family a community Everyone is a mirror upon themselves. But nowadays we live with this main character syndrome. Everyone thinks they're unique and individual and different. Yet they are, but we're still human. We're still bound to the species that we are. Thus we must be kinder. Because what does Shakespeare say? He said, if every man got what they truly deserved, we'd all get a whipping. Because we're not free. None of us are perfect. And in self-reflection, you realise you're not perfect. How does one examine? First one needs to have an ideal for themselves, a future they see, an ideal is like the sun. For all the darkness of the night, we are eased by the light that shall come in the morning. Ideals, goals or inspirations are then like our sun. They shall always shine light over the darkest days and illuminate the path. So using the imagination, examine a goal or an ideal that best fits your purpose. Then, through the examination, you shall see if you're on your way or straying away. I argue often that a lot of the mental health problems nowadays is simply because we have lost the art of imagining an ideal. We often despair the future instead of being optimistic about it. War, disease, poverty and pain often destroy our ambition to imagine a place for ourselves in the future that could be beautiful. But I urge and will always urge Examine the beautiful and see where you can fit in it. Or, as Nietzsche would say, create an ideal that is beautiful with you at the forefront of it. Imagine an ideal and examine your path towards it. And you shall be able to help others towards theirs too. This is what the teacher is. Now, after all examination and self-reflection and introspection, and say you have an ideal, and say you have a goal, what is the... the the pinnacle, harmony is the goal. What we often hear is one must live a life of balance. Balance this, balance that. I'm just trying to achieve balance, bro. You just got to get the balance right, my friend. What? Oh, I'm just trying to be balanced in life. I argue that balance is a nice way to look at things. But as Socrates would say, let's examine and see if that's true. Balancing proposes the image of two scales, two points of measurements, a tipping point. Yet, how could you balance the innumerable factors that make up life? The past, the present, the future, pain, duties, finance, work, love, family, physical health, bodily health, education, the future. How you treat people in business is very different to how you would treat your friends or lovers. Thus, always we are in conflict with our actions and the areas of our lives are so fragmented, fragmented it's almost impossible to balance it. I mean, how you guys treat girls is very different how you treat your friends. So how can you balance the two? Work life is very different to the student life. How you are with your partner is different to how you are with your mother. So again, I must ask you, how do you balance life? Life itself, as you can see, is more than two measuring points. In fact, I forgot to almost mention the unseen aspect of life. Disease, unluckiness, death, and many more disasters that strike life. I mean, you could be on a nice path one day and a raccoon comes out and attacks you. This is what kind of life is. So how can you balance? So again, I must ask you again and again and again, how can you live a life of balance? Life, as we see, is multidimensional. There's many things that are going on and we've got to balance it like this. How? Balance is not what you should seek. For as we have just noticed, it's pretty two-dimensional. The answer is to achieve harmony. Socrates and Plato often argue life is music itself. The good life is harmonious and musical. You, the one who lives, is the orchestrator. This way, for all the fragmented elements of life that broke the balancing scales, they are now turned into instruments itself. Love, death, friends, family, business, work are now a part of the orchestra. Now, no, now, do not say my life feels imbalanced. It is simply not achieving harmony. A wrong note somewhere is playing. And your job is to be examining or listening. Since you are the orchestrator, you must correct it. The beautiful thing about this is that every area of your life could be achieving harmony. 
Work could be good, money could be good, love could be good. But maybe the physical side of life, health, the body, the mind, is playing a bit off note. We don't ruin the whole symphony because one wrong note is playing. Like I said, we listen and we fix it, okay? When it's imbalance and balancing the scales, it's always a constant this and this and this. So it's always one extreme to the next extreme, one extreme to the next extreme. But the harmony is just, uh, oh, oh, something's playing wrong in my life, just to make sure it's all fitting in and live a life of harmony. And what is society at the end of the day? When society gets along with each other, it's harmonious. We don't say it's a balanced society, it's a harmonious one. What is love? What is music? It's, it's, it's harmony. But anyway, I think I've got my point through. To live the unexamined life is not worth living at all. <sighs> my mouth is dry. Um, yeah, so... Thank you as usual again for listening. The next episode will be about nightclubs and casinos. I already know it, got planning now. But um, yeah, like, subscribe and uh, comment. Let me know what you think. And uh, yeah, free feel to message me. I don't mind having a conversation with you guys. And uh, yeah, take care.